Um, my name's uh, Andrew Warren. and I am uh, a Cambridge resident, which is probably the best way to put it. And I wanted actually to go back to uh, the issue that was concerning uh, Emily, uh, was, which is the uh, responses that she'd had from uh, Richard Toll and followers of Richard Toll to uh, the excellent book, which you I haven't read a lady that book from some while, but I have read that one. Um, and the suggestion, and it obviously uh, was concerning you from the fact that you uh, uh, endeavoured to, to respond to it, and that it, uh, you were being accused of not including the key issues like the fact that it gets warmer, then we don't use as much heating. But uh, the corollary to that you came back to saying, yes, but look at the spread of air conditioning in or potential spread of air conditioning in Egypt. Uh, you know, and the potential spread of air conditioning even in buildings in, in the UK. But it's the other part of the issue which relates to uh, mortality uh, issues. Um, from the time that the, the Blair government uh, actually passed a, a, an act to abolish uh, fuel poverty by 2016, uh, I was a member of the government's advisory group uh, on fuel poverty. And we were uh, abolished shortly before 2016, by which time it was proven that we hadn't actually succeeded in abolishing fuel poverty, as you showed. But one thing we did do was to look at the reasons for the fact that we do have uh, this very excessive amount of winter deaths uh, in the United Kingdom, which are not comparable to other countries with very similar climates. And that was, that was a very important issue. So that you were sharing the figures relating to the United Kingdom, and they, we do have excessive increases in winter in, in mortality. But the reason for that is a very simple one. It is that we live in very drafty and cold homes, ones which uh, those living in uh, places with similar climates, northern Germany, uh, the Netherlands, um, Denmark and Sweden, just simply don't have to endure. That is why we have fuel poverty uh, in this country. That is why we have uh, excess winter mortality. And it is a complete nonsense that Richard Toll, I'm happy to put this happily on the record, that Richard Toll is yet again uh, pursuing in his attempt to downgrade the, the threat that climate change uh, produces. And I have to say, just in, in, in answer to the earlier discussion, having worked uh, as uh, in the reinsurance business for many years as an underwriter, the key issue on this is the relative risks and that the fact that we may be dealing with something which is only going to happen one in 500 years and it's reduced to one in 100 years, that is incredibly important. And the fact that you can't prove that it will happen is irrelevant. It's the risk. Thank you. Uh, we'll gather a few questions together before we get into one. Sitting down close to the <laughs> it's still it's um, I was very interested in, uh, sorry, Dick King's Green and uh, Cambridge University Engineering Department, uh, Signal Processing Group. Um, I was very interested in Emily's conclusion that we need to find a methodology behind the different sorts of data. Um, and this also related to what Tom was saying. Um, it reminds me that um, Zulin Garamani is in the department here, um, who runs the uh, machine learning group. Um, he developed a thing called the automated statistician, um, which is an automated way of taking arbitrary amounts of uh, data and deriving sort of statistical reports from it. Um, have you sort of considered maybe using some of that sort of work? in order to um, help to reduce these sort of automated analyses of all sorts of different types of climate data. So just from a, from a practical 
point of view, it strikes me as though if we're to take seriously the need to try to provide um, robust scientific input into this, the range of different potential decisions that um, are required to be taken associated with um, building resilience and managing the risk of future climate change um, across, you know, I, I emphasised health today, but it could, I could have emphasised water security, or I could have emphasised the food system, or I could have emphasised the infrastructure, or many other different dimensions. There are so many different potential end uses. It would be simply impossible to do something um, across the scale of different <coughs> decisions um, that are required, going to be required to be taken unless you have some kind of automated process. So simply from a practical perspective, then I think if we can make progress in that direction, we will be um, doing a great service to you know, a large number of stakeholders who are going to need to be making these kinds of decisions over the coming years. Uh, my name is Stuart Grassi, I'm a Cambridge resident and was once a member of the engineering department. In your uh, graph of uh, carbon dioxide in Hawaii, uh, it looked to me like the trend is going up but the variations stay much the same. Is that the case or is that, uh, am I not seeing something correctly? There's an annual variation that you sit in the carbon dioxide and it, in projecting it into the future, your annual variation is actually in pieces, but actually for the last 40 years, it looks much the same. Oh, okay, yes. So, um, so, so the annual cycle is largely down to the difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and the amount of land and therefore plants um, that are in the two hemispheres. Um, and so there is, there is an annual cycle of as a result of that, more carbon being stored or not in, the, in those plants during, during the year. Um, and the projections into the future is not that that variability particularly increases, that was just, you know, that, that was an, an outcome of a particular model and the, and the parameters that were put into that model. So one wouldn't expect that seasonal cycle variability to particularly increase into the future. Jacob to Melissa from the engineering department currently. Um, seems like there's lots of interesting things you can get out for improving forecasting and therefore making decisions about adaptation. Do you think there's anything in this kind of area that we could do to make decisions involving mitigation and ways of reducing or changing the course of climate change? Thanks very much. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'm interested in uh, in terms of communication of these results, is that uh, uh, sorry, I work on marine planning, so I deal with a lot of stakeholders on the ground. Uh, is that um, whether it's fishermen, wind farm companies, shipping, there's a very, very variable understanding of what risk actually means. So what Andrew Warren's comments were really interesting because I think the insurance industry has got to say about this. But how you communicate risk to people is really important because otherwise they just don't get it. And equally, I know from working on the ground that a lot of people uh, day to day are just not interested in hearing about climate change issues anymore. They kind of glaze over because they just keep hearing the same messages. So I'm wondering whether you could comment on how you take the work that you're doing that is around climate change messages that can be used by people to make decisions. And also about what you're doing on risk, how you better communicate that to people on the ground rather than to, you know, people this room, we probably get it. Thank you. Okay, well, I can go back to the mitigation questions one now. Let me do that one first. Um, so, so, in terms of, um, I think one, one area that is relevant to mitigation, but I think that um, these kind of techniques might be really valuable in terms of helping with, um, is actually the climate models themselves. So, um, there are many processes within the climate model that are parameterized. Um, so classically, um, processes to do with clouds, which happen on small scales, but also in, in my world of the oceans, there are many processes that happen on small scales that are prioritized within those models. 
Um, those parameterizations are based on our understanding of the physics and include observational um, uh, information. And if we can use some of these machine learning techniques to improve those parameterizations in models, then that would be one way of then um, helping improve our long term projections um, that would be then relevant to the mitigation issue. Um, in terms of communication, um, so uh, I mean, one of the key, uh, th there was a survey that was done just this last week um, on attitudes to climate change in the UK. And um, one of the questions was asked, indeed, around heat waves. Um, how concerned are people in the UK about um, uh, the increase, potential increase in heat waves um, as a consequence of climate change? And uh, about 50% of the population said that this was something they were concerned about, which is much lower percentage than the percentage of the population that say they're concerned about climate change generally. Um, so I think that actually, if we're able to provide robust information about aspects of the climate that are relevant to people and are relevant to their, to their lives locally, um, things that they can identify with, then actually I think that well, I, you know, that's an important part of raising public understanding of the climate issue as a whole. So I think it's, you know, a, a lot of the time the climate debate is around these numbers like one degree or two degrees or four degrees in the future, which are perhaps rather abstract. And actually by being able to provide information that's much more relevant and tangible, um, then I think that that would um, help raise the perception of the risks associated with climate change in general. Um, yeah, I would just add that perhaps there are um, kind of practical things that one can do to help mitigate um, the, 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 the level of carbon emissions that, that, that we're seeing and, and maybe some data to, to think about that. But yeah, I mentioned the data center cooling um, as, as, as one example of kind of using machine learning to, to, to actively reduce the amount of energy used by, by, by a large data center. And you know, these techniques are potentially applicable in other industrial scenarios as well, so that could be quite an interesting thing. Another thing is um, the work that Scott's been, been doing on, on uh, which uh, Henry highlighted in, in uh, the Egypt um, uh, example, where, where that, um, so those temperatures correlate directly with the amount of energy used for cooling. Um, so if one could do better prediction, perhaps you can do better energy um, and, and similar, similar work on other things like transportation and so on. That's, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the, 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 the opposite aspect, aspect not modeling, but kind of the actual mitigation. Just a question back there. Um, hey there. Uh, my name is Andre Andrew Bradley, and I'm also from the engineering department. There's quite a lot of us here tonight. Uh, my question goes back to the question which I before me asked about communicating risk, but also perhaps the idea of um, communicating something of a probabilistic nature, because obviously any all, all these all these projections, there, there's a probability of them of them being being right and being wrong. And how do you communicate that aspect of it to people on the ground, especially if you're looking at um, issues of sort of uh, disaster disaster risk reduction? Um, you know, how, how do you get people on the ground to choose which, which option to go for when there's, there's a probability associated to, to, to the various outcomes? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, well, so, so, you know, it is well known that um, communicating probabilities to a, a wide audience is, is, is challenging. But actually, one way to do that is to talk in the language of risk. You know, people. Everyone sort of understands that there's a certain risk associated with crossing the road, for example. Um, and uh, so I, I think that actually there are ways that one can you know, talk about these things and stuff, such that one can try and provide information that people can then choose to make their own decisions. Obviously, every individual has their own different risk thresholds um, that they're prepared to accept. So it's not a universal answer that we're trying to persuade everyone to. Um, undertake. We're just wanting to provide people with information that they can then make their own decisions. Question. 
Hello, yeah, uh, my name is Juan Sebastián Cañareda, I'm also from the engineering department. Um, quite interested in the topic of adaptation as well, but in the context of developing countries. And uh, I think uh, you have dwelled into a very interesting topic about how to use really big sets of data. But I think in these contexts where there's not much historical data, there's another problem. So my question is more about how do you suggest to work with not big uh, sets of data, but really small sets of data and take decisions as well? Okay, well, while we're thinking, is there someone not from the engineering department? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? <clears throat> uh, my name is Sabia, and uh, I would like to ask, uh, how much data do you actually use uh, for your prediction? Is it including geological data, or is it just like uh, measurements from like existing uh, you know, uh, meteorological centers? So, how far the data extends back in time? Yes, um, uh, so you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the, the Egypt example, as if you, if you come and talk to Scott, he'll tell you that um, the, there's very little meteorological data um, available for for Egypt, and and there's always an issue as to the quality of data as well. So it's not simply that does the data exist, but how good quality is it? Um, so you're you're right that there's a real challenge there. Um, and that speaks to the issue that Tom was raising, that actually in many of these instances we're dealing with small data rather than big data that we're trying to incorporate. And one thing that I think could be interesting to try and explore in that context um, is whether or not there are proxies, so whether or not there's other data sets that we might have more availability of that are themselves correlated with the things that we're interested in um, that we could potentially um, use to try and build up the amount of um, historical data that we've, that we've got that we could bring to bear on the problem, but that, you know, that's the sort of for the future rather than something we're actively working on at the moment. Um, in terms of what other data, in, in, in terms of climate modelling generally, um, then um, you know all, all sorts of data, you know, all available data is somehow used at some stages of the, of the climate modelling process. Um, so, for example, um, climate model will be used to go back into the distant past to try to see whether um, we can replicate climate conditions in the distant past um, using our climate models. So there's, you know, whatever, whatever evidence base we can use to uh, test our models against or incorporate within the models, then, then that's fine. Any other? Hugh, did you want to say something? Yeah. So I'm not sure this means we're, we're winding up, but I did want to say something about the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series that uh, starts up next Thursday in the Winstonian Lecture Theatre in Trinity College. And those of you who have, um, have seen the programme for this lecture series will know that there's, uh, there's no lecture in this room next week or the week after. So you're welcome to come to Trinity College if there are any spaces left, but then there aren't uh, that many left. Uh, the lectures there are at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday the 23rd of February and then Thursday the 2nd of March. Then on the uh, Thursday the 9th of March, there are two lectures. There is one as part of this series uh, given by Professor Ramanathan, uh, and that will be held in the Yusuf the other theater. room. It's called the Yusuf the Theatre. Right. So, and I think that's in, that in the in the type room. It's in the it's the building next door, and that's at five thirty. Then um, uh, there will no no doubt be some refreshments afterwards. And one one thought which has not yet been confirmed, but it's a possibility if it works, 
is that given that the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series lectures are being live streamed, that we might see if that room is free, uh, that we can live stream from the Winstanley direct to there. So it may be possible that you could just have a live stream and then go back to your seats and uh, reconvene for, uh, the, for that lecture. So next week's lecture is being given by Brani uh, uh, Worthington, who is um, House of Lords, and she uh, was one of the uh, main instigators, the, the, prime, the principal author of the 2008 Climate Change Act. And she is uh, talking about the, the, uh, the interface between uh, politics and the science of climate change. The following week, we've got Anthony Hobley from the uh, Carbon Tracker Initiative, who's looking really at whether uh, the, the, the finance of the fossil fuel industry makes any sense at all. And perhaps we ought to be thinking about fossil fuels from a financial perspective. So then we have uh, Ramanathan's talk on Thursday, the uh, 9th of March, and, and, uh, and Kevin Anderson, uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, climate scientist, uh, on, on that. So then on the 16th of March in the Cambridge Science Festival at the Lady Mitchell Hall, uh, Martin Rees and others will be on a panel discussion chaired by Oliver Morton from The Economist um, talking about um, Paris, COP22, how do we get from there to a um, no more than two degrees C temperature rise. So it's a panel discussion on how we might achieve that. Now, following Cambridge Climate Lecture Series is if you Google CCLS, you will find your way to the, CC, the climate series.com website. Um, am I allowed to ask one question? Oh, <laughs> because um, and that is that um, if you the more detail you get in your predictions, the better your predictions get. Is there a sense that that means that, ah, uh, yes, so you, you who live near that river are more likely to get flooded than me because I live a little bit further away from that river. So that means climate change is not my problem, it's your problem. Now, I know it sounds silly, but when we get better detail, then we can find out who might not have to worry so much. Is there a sense that at the moment, the predictions are broad enough for us to be able to say it's everybody's problem. But maybe the more we know, the, the worse, the harder it will be to, to get people to take climate change seriously. Is that, is that nuts? Well, I, first of all, one of the key things that actually has happened since climate